Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Silver Slater, and I'm the artistic director of the Cabot Trail Writers Festival. And uh, we are thrilled uh, to be presenting tonight's event, Long Story Short, in partnership with the Atlantic Book Awards Festival. Um, so I know uh, this evening that we're all connecting from different places and territories, but I'm here in Unamagi, uh, Cape Breton, uh, in, which is part of Mi'kmaq, the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And uh, so as I invite all of you to consider the territory and original people uh, of the place where you reside, I thought I would share, just before we hear from tonight's writers, uh, a short reading from one of the great writers of Unamagi, Magi, the poet Rita Jo. And so the following passage uh, is quoted from the prologue to her autobiography, Song of Rita Jo. My greatest wish is that there will be more writing from my people and that our children will read it. I have said again and again that our history would be different if it had been expressed by us. My people were known as great orators and the ones I have heard and read about have presented their views truthfully. But the way our views were passed into history and literature by the so-called discoverers has done harm in more ways than can be imagined. I hope the future holds a better promise. Our heritage has not died. It lives in the eyes of our people. And so tonight's event honors the nominees of an award named for another great writer of Unamagi, the magnificent Alistair MacLeod. And we are so delighted to have his son, Alexander MacLeod, here this evening to moderate this event. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to introduce him, but I first wanted to share a few quick announcements from the Atlantic Book Awards Festival. As part of the Atlantic Book Awards Festival, the Nova Scotia Book Awards, with prizes awarded to Nova Scotian authors only, will be presented at a ceremony on Monday, June 5th at Brightwood Golf and Country Club starting at 7 p.m., hosted by author Charlene Carr. Tickets are $10 and for sale online. The Atlantic Book Awards will be presented on Wednesday, June 7th at Paula Regan Hall in Halifax Central Library starting at 7 p.m., hosted by author and journalist Lindsay Rook. Tickets to the Book Awards Gala are $20, also available online. Both awards shows will also be live streamed for book lovers everywhere. And so there's a full week of amazing festival events featuring nominated authors. And if you want to learn more about that and see the schedule, you can visit www.atlanticbookawards.ca, where you can also purchase tickets and access the live stream for the awards shows. And so now it is my pleasure to introduce our host this, our host this evening, Alexander McLeod. Alexander was born in Inverness, Cape Breton and raised in Windsor, Ontario. His first collection, Light Lifting, published by Biblioasis, was a national bestseller, won an Atlantic Book Award and was a finalist for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, the Thomas Head Riddell Fiction Award and the Commonwealth Book Prize. In 2019, he won an O. Henry Award for his short story, Lagomorph, which was originally published in Granta and is included in his new and incredible collection, Animal Person. Animal Person is nominated for the 2023 Nova Scotia Book Awards Dartmouth Book Award for Fiction. Alexander holds degrees from the University of Windsor, the University of Notre Dame, and McGill. He currently lives in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, and teaches at St. Mary's University in Halifax. Please welcome Alexander McLeod. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, thank you to the uh, Atlantic Book Awards, the Nova Scotia Book Awards, uh, and to the whole um, squad of people that make uh, our region's literary culture so excellent. I'm reaching out to you from uh, Halifax today, and I'm hoping that you're all safe uh, wherever you are. I just closed the window here of my office where we have beautiful rain falling on Halifax uh, at last, uh, and rain is general all over the Maritimes uh, right now, but I know that many families, many uh, readers, many people intimately connected with this uh, prize week have been, uh, have had their lives profoundly interrupted. And so we send you our, our best wishes and our hope uh, that things go well uh, in this uh, cooling, dampening period of our lives. And we hope that everything goes 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 better <laughs> this week than, than last week. Also, uh, every year, 
when this prize is awarded. I bring greetings from my mom and from my brothers and my sister. We are very grateful that this prize was named after our father who cared, our father and husband who cared so much about this form. And we're so uh, proud. I really wanna thank the jurors uh, for making this list. I don't know if Bridget and Megan and Elaine have read each other's work yet, but this is one, I'm serious, one of the strongest short lists for a book prize that I have ever seen. All these books, these three books are tremendous. And uh, we as readers are just lucky to have them uh, out in the world. I think you three are lucky to have this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. So I'll just lay out our plan for the day uh, or the hour. I'm gonna introduce each writer in alphabetical order uh, individually. They're each gonna read for three to five minutes. Then when the three readings are done, I'll lead a short uh, a question and answer interview kind of collective uh, thing where I have some questions that I think apply to all their works. And then in the chat audience, if you have questions, um, as you're listening or anything that we say in conversation that triggers something interesting in, in your thoughts, uh, you can enter them into the chat and at about uh, 7.40, 7.45, we will turn chat word and try to answer as many of those as we can. So that's the, that's the housekeeping and uh, we're going to uh, dive, uh, dive right in with uh, Megan, we'll go will go first. So I'm going to read these prepared remarks, and then I have lots of details about each of their books. But the copy says that Megan Rose Allen is a writer and an educator with a PhD in mathematics from Dalhousie University. In a previous life, she was a cog in the military industrial complex, but now she lives in New Brunswick, where she writes when not lecturing in mathematics at Mount Allison University. Her first book, a novel, Enid Strange, was published by DCB Cormorant and was a finalist for the 2018 New Brunswick Book Awards. The Summer the School Burned Down is her first collection of short stories, and it is magnificent. Uh, I believe that this book does uh, reveal certain things that happen when you have a PhD in mathematics and start writing stories. Uh, I believe that these, these stories are, uh, are so so precisely constructed and there's a certain calculus in them, Megan, I think uh, approaching a limit uh, and coming right up to it and uh, and then leaving the re leaving the the equation to sort of uh, explode in the reader's mind. Really, really beautiful work. So I'm going to turn it over to Megan to read and then we'll continue our journey. Thank you to Alexander for such um such kind and inspiring remarks. Um, I'm going to read from the story where the title of this book came from. So I'm going to be reading the first little section of a story called The Happiest Place on Earth. The summer the school burned down, my father drove us to Florida. Why do they always got to do it when it's so hot, he grumbled. Doesn't make much sense, does it? The question wasn't for me. None of my father's questions were ever for me. Maybe it works better in the heat, my brother shrugged. Dunno. It's a good point. My father slapped a hand across Joey's back. Somewhere along the line, my father had become convinced that my brother, for all his fooling in school, was an unrecognized genius. I'd seen Joey spill ice cream in the dog's bowl and then lick it back out, but that didn't mean he wasn't book smart. In fact, that might mean all Joey was, was book smart. We'd never been to Florida. We'd been to Texas, Arkansas, Indiana, Ohio twice, it was closest. But Florida? Nope, never. The longer drive didn't worry me. It was summer and I wasn't going to be pulled out of school this time. You're gonna mind, my father said. The car I borrowed has got no air conditioning. Think we can stay a bit longer, my brother asked. Afterwards? I knew what Joey was thinking about. Same thing every kid has been thinking about Florida since 1965. Disney World. Especially since there's no more school. What's gonna happen with that commodum, I asked. The same hand that slapped Joey collegially across his shoulder now painfully slapped the back of my head. Come autumn, talk normal, my dad ordered. If there's no more school, they can't force us to go, Joey grinned. They'll probably just bus us to the next school over, I pointed out. They're legally required to provide us with a public education. What's wrong with you, my father said with another head smack. Let your brother dream. 
my dad walked over to give me a third smack for good measure, but he hadn't said no to Disney. Brief, brief, just, just, uh, let's just say there's more going on in that story than just that drive, but, uh, but uh, we, we will, uh, we will come to it. We will come to it. Okay. Uh, Bridget Canning's debut novel, The Greatest Hits of Wanda Janes, was a finalist for the 2017 BMO Winterset Award, the Margaret and John Savage First Book Award, and the Newfoundland Fiction Award, and was long listed for the Dublin Literary Award, Dublin International Literary Award. It is currently being adapted for a film. Her second novel, Some People's Children, was a finalist for the 2020 BMO Winterset Award and the Thomas Riddell Award. Bridget holds an MA in creative writing from Memorial University and a master's of literary education from Mount St. Vincent. In 2019, she received the CBC Emerging Artists Awards with Arts Newfoundland. She lives in St. John's where she writes and teaches. Forgot to read the book summary for Megan, but I will in a second. The book summary of No One Knows About Us is a collection of short fiction about how we find connection in a disconnected world. Relationships exist under the wire and conversations and revelations occur in secret pockets, both literally and physically. The characters conduct secret acts of vengeance, kindness and vigilantism motivated by their hidden yearnings, grudges, losses, fears and fixations. What I think is amazing about this book is its reflection on intimacy, intimate uh, intimate connections or missed connections, uh, and also the way characterization works in these um, in these stories. Way well, point of view uh, is always is always working on intimacy. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here, Bridget. Can you read for us a bit? Absolutely. Thank. Can you hear me? Okay. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Alexander. And thank you for that reading, Megan. I'm really intrigued by that story. I'm going to read the first couple of pages of the first story in the book. It's called Scene. Uh, I'm going to put a timer on, just to make sure. Uh, this, this story starts with an e uh, a message received. To Irene Hogan from Dennis Power. Date, January 13th, 2018. Active one hour, 13 minutes ago. Irene. I know this is coming out of the blue. I'm in Hawaii and they've announced a ballistic missile is headed towards us. We've been told to seek immediate shelter. We haven't talked for a long time. I want you to know I never stopped thinking about you. Every day I'm sorry I didn't do things differently. I love you, Irene. I've missed you. Yours, Dennis. Irene is in her kitchen. She makes a cup of tea while the radio blaze, blares coverage of the false alarm in Hawaii. Reports say it was a button push, pushed in error during an employee changeover. She listens to a woman's voice full of tearful vibrato. We came here for our honeymoon. At first we thought it was a hoax, an Orson Welles thing. Then everyone was panicking. We didn't know what to do. We stayed in our hotel room. We called everyone we loved. How do you feel now, the reporter asked, knowing it was all a mistake. Right now, I'm just happy, the woman says. I'm with my husband and everyone knows we're safe. Irene gazes at her phone. Reading Dennis's message produces a notification that it has been seen. Her name and tiny profile avatar sit below it like a punctuation mark. The radio commentator remarks how tensions between North Korea and the U.S. translate into feel fearful governments. Hawaii is no exception. Everyone exists in a heightened state of readiness. Irene moves into the living room and settles on the sofa. She turns off her phone before she checks what's new on Netflix. It's too easy to end up looking up reviews of the offerings. She prefers to watch and see for herself. Later, she accidentally watches a bad film. She only wants to read the description, but her finger slips and hits play. Shag it, she figures. The movie is chock full of the kind of tropes they discuss in the film studies class she took last year. The male lead returns home after running away from his emotions. He hungers to reconnect with the woman he mistreated. But when he approaches her at a party, she tells him to go to hell and storms off. He grabs her arm and peers into her gorgeous and raised, enraged expression with absolute sincerity. Irene imagines her classmates' responses. Oh, look, woman says no, but he won't stop. Woman resorts, rewards his persistence. What tripe, no wonder, no wonder no one understands consent. 
But Irene tries not to get frustrated with bad writing anymore. These types of films demand a little suspension of disbelief in exchange for cheap escapism. In real life, actual drama is rare, even when things end abruptly. Back when she decided not to forgive Dennis the last time, she simply pretended he was dead. If she saw him around, it was an apparition. She wasn't about to start talking to ghosts. And at this point, they weren't talking anyway, so it was straightforward. No greetings or eye contact. When she explained this theory to her roommate and her friends, they all played along. Played along. There were many satisfying moments of bitchy aloofness. Don't look now, phantom Dennis at three o'clock. Alert the ghost guard. Years later, when he was elected to city council, she was so accustomed to considering him gone, she hardly recognized his new image. Goateed, got what you need, hempware Dennis really was dead. Counselor Dennis Power was sanitized with hair products and glossy slogans. Put power in Ward 4, vote power for change. Name like that, people think you're born to it. Irene knows for the movie to reflect reality, the man and woman would have to be filmed from opposite sides of the room. They stay close to, his, to their friends. If the woman became separated from her clique, the man might approach or wave. A stiff exchange would inform him she's not interested. He would then retreat to his friends with ego safely bubble wrapped. No hijinks or Oracle-like supporting character who sees through their walls to recognize two matched souls who speak a truth to pierce their bruised, bruised pride. No perfect storm of coincidence, a broken elevator, a random blizzard to trap the couple so they squabble it out until finally succumbing to exasperated angst oils, long overdue humping. When the movie ends, she scores it thumbs down. It is satisfying to tell the algorithm how she feels. Thank you. Again, that one ends. That one ends different than it starts, but I suppose that's nice. Okay, Elaine. Elaine McCluskey is the author of three acclaimed short story collections: "Hello, Sweetheart," "Valerie the Great," and "The Watermelon Social." and two novels, Going Fast and The Most Heartless Town in Canada. She's a Journey Prize finalist, and her stories have appeared in journals such as the Antigonish Review, uh, Room, and Subterranean. She lives in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. The 17 stories in Raphael Has Pretty Eyes follow characters who have reached a four-way stop in life. Some are deciding whether to follow signs or to defy them. Others find a sinkhole forming beneath their feet. A former fast-talking big bucks uh, radio host now lives as a divorced payday loner working in a strip mall. A football wide receiver at a small Canadian university works the night shift as a bouncer while recovering from his third concussion. A well-liked city councillor is arrested on a packed bus. As one character puts it, life is just one extended series of anecdotes strung together until they kill you. Set in the Maritimes but, but transcending regional boundaries, McCluskey's stories are experimental, sometimes provocative, and often about the those lives on the margins. Smart, compassionate, and unsparing, Raphael has pretty eyes, explores the absurdity and interconnectedness of a life adrift. And I've already told Elaine this, but what I love most about her stories is the overall construction of them. They are spring-loaded masterpieces, uh, just waiting, as you'll see, and I think this applies to the other stories as well. Uh, lots happens in the last tenth, the ninth tenth, uh, the ninth tenth, is a very interesting territory in Elaine McCluskey short story. So I'll turn it over to Elaine. Awesome. Um, can you see me? Because I can't see me anymore. Am I okay on that? Yeah. I think Hello? you. I think you turned your camera off. No, I didn't turn my camera off. Well, only your name is speaking right now. Okay. Um, I haven't touched any buttons. Uh, Andy. <laughs> Hi, Elaine. Um, I can see uh, in the uh, panelists panel that your uh, your video is flickering in and out. So if you've got a um, a plugged in camera, you may want to check the connection. Uh, no, I don't have a plugged in camera. Um, OK, um, just, just read and we'll, we'll just, it'll, it'll come back. You'll come back. I have faith. I'll just, I'll just read. All right, folks. Um, I'm going to read from a story called It Will Happen. and. Um, Alex was talking about the endings. He's very kind about the endings of my stories. And this one is a little different because it has a, 
a fantastic ending and a happy ending. Um, so this story is called, It Will Happen. James Dontremont had been running for the bus. The number 99 had never in 30 years arrived at the same time. And on this day, it was early. James couldn't afford to be late for school. He couldn't afford trouble, so he ran, hoping that the driver with the creepy clown tattoo would not pull away, pretending as he often did not to see him. It's hard to describe what it feels like to be hit by 3,500 pounds of metal, traveling at 50 kilometers an hour. The bumper of a 1996 Dodge Grand Caravan hit James's right hip, sending him skyward. To James, his spiral through the air felt in slow motion, and he could later recall the vague sensation of one Adidas track shoe flying off. People turned their heads when it happened because the sound was awful, the sound of fear, the thud of the unforeseeable, a low lament from the pavement. They turned their head as gawkers do and they squinted. It was an uncommonly sunny day for Halifax and the scene seemed overlit as though someone was making a TV movie with Ethan Hawke. Backlit by the strangeness of what had happened, James took on a surreal form, motionless, no longer a person. He could have been a struck porcupine or a velour sofa that had toppled off the back of a delivery truck. James had blonde hair, that much you could see from the sidelines. Like many fair young men, he had yet to grow a real beard. If James was on a Florida beach forming a human pyramid, instead of lying broken on a grimy street, he would be in the middle row, but your eyes would be drawn to him because of his sun-streaked hair and his smile. When James' smile escaped, it was as lovely as a chance encounter at the mall with your primary teacher, the nice one who brought a hamster to school and let you name it. Face down, James had landed in a bed of shattered grill parts, and he thought for a moment that he would jump up and walk away before people noticed. He tried to lift his left leg, but it was numb. As James lay on the street, his thinking was so scrambled that he worried about the pink winged fairy floating before his eyes, all organza and glitter, was she cold? <laughs> thank you thank you well audience i think you even from those samples you can start to see uh some points of connection between uh between these writers but i'm going to start with the most basic question and it really is a uh a question uh from me is because when we're reading these uh these descriptions all of you have written novels mm -hmm. in the past do you not have any good advisors telling you not to write any short stories? Why on earth would successful novelists, you see I'm phrasing this, framing this question uh, in, in a way that I, that I hope will result in a defense of the short story. So you can't be criticizing, you can't be criticizing the short story when you're up for the prize. So why, or what are you seeing novelists in the short story that uh, you can pull off in the short story, because I think you are all <laughs> performing amazing tricks in here. Uh, but what are you seeing in the short story when uh, you have written uh, novels before? Does anyone want to go first? I will. Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, immediate gratification. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you write a novel, you may be four years into it and discover that it's garbage. Uh, when you're writing a short story, you you know fairly soon if you if you have something working. If you have a character you believe in, if you have a visceral impact, if you have a surprise. So for me, the the short story is all about impact, and um, you can get that in a short story. You can get it in a novel, but that's my main thing with short stories. Bridget and Megan have included novellas, or kind of novellas, I suppose, long, long, long journeys also in their short story collections. But same question to you two. Uh, what are you seeing in the short story form that um, changes your narrative, uh, gives you a different set of narrative possibilities, I suppose? I, I think I just thought it was funny because uh, what Alay just said is like immediate hmm. gratification, like, a novel takes uh, four years of like, so you have short stories that haven't taken you four years? Because <laughs> I definitely do. I definitely do. Um, I, find, I find for me, it's kind of more of an exploration of a, of a moment. Um, 
it's kind, it's kind of, I'm right now I'm teaching a, I'm teaching a creative writing course at Mun. I'm teaching young adult literature. And one of the ways that most, not all of course, young adult literature is different from adult literature. It's just often confined by time. So for example, a young adult uh, um, story might start, like it might be a uh, summer camp or like one semester at school or something that happened on a weekend at a party, like a kind of a moment of coming of age. So sometimes when I think about creative writing, it is about kind of um, uh, one particular moment in time and how it kind of, you know, it, it's like a, a drop in the, in, the, in the water with the ripples. So a novel is kind of like the whole storm, but the short stories <laughs> drop in the water. I don't know if that makes sense or if that sounds really cheesy, but uh, for me, and, and not that some of the short stories I've written don't take place over longer periods of time, but they usually are just something, the, the only explanation I want to do is of a particular moment or of a particular drop of water, if that makes sense. Sure. Megan? I spent a long time trying to make everything into a novel. Basically, because the advice I got from publishers is short stories aren't going to sell. <laughs> and so I spent a long time doing that. And I only came up with one successful novel out of that for trying to force things to be something that they just, they just weren't. And so I went back to just making a bunch of things short stories because that's what they were. And I was trying to put them into something that wasn't going to work for them. And maybe it's a bit like what Bridget said. It was just some of these things are really just an instant. And that's all I've been granted by the muses or my imagination and anything else is just really me forcing something that's not there. And I also I like short stories, so I don't. I don't see, I know that sometimes there's that, well, you know, you write short stories to get to the novel and then you're a novelist. Like it's sort of like training wheels, but that's not really, mm. what I, <laughs> but that's never really what I felt anyways. So I, I just been trying, I guess pretty much since the start of COVID, I've just been writing what works. And if it works as a short story, that's fine. If it works as a novella, that's fine. I do have some novel or novelish length things that are also in works, but short stories are what they are. Sometimes, sometimes you just make cupcakes. Sometimes you make a huge wedding cake, right? This one isn't necessarily better than the other. Um, I think when you read each other's work, you'll see lots of um, good points of connection, but I think you're all uh, hilarious. You're all uh, funny, but, um but also very dark very dark so uh a classic question which has been asked since the uh ancient greeks talk to me a little bit about the relationship you see between uh comedy and tragedy or in some of your cases it's almost even in a single paragraph you can do both um um so uh how is your how is your darkness affected by your light or vice versa I'm going to go in reverse order. Megan, you can go first on this one and we'll go back because you have lots of it. <laughs> I think you're a dark light. These are dark light stories a lot or dark, 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 dark. Yeah. Um, as sad as it is, I think there is unfortunately a lot of darkness in the world. There's a lot of bad things that have been happening. As you mentioned earlier, just in our general area, there's been the <laughs> forest fires and things like that. and Sometimes I don't, sometimes just things are bad and you just make a joke. It's some, or you just try to say something that maybe relieves the tension a little bit. Um, I never think of myself as a funny person. So like when people say I'm funny, I'm always like, okay. And I just nod. So again, sometimes I guess I just write how I feel in my head, how it, the words come out and if people find like there's a sort of dichotomy between light and dark, that's great, but it's never intentional. I don't ever intend to be funny because I don't think I'm a funny person. Um, I don't think this answers the question. I think I've just gone off on a weird tangent. Oh, no, no, but... no. I think, that's, I think that's super revealing, actually. I think that's yeah. super revealing because I do see you handling all the handling all the molten, like the mm -hmm. handling all the dark, dark material. And it could be that like you're handling it so deftly that 
that it, it's human it's humanized i guess and that and that that does yeah. uh, that does sometimes relate to comedy and i mean just the one other thing that when you were saying that it reminded me of my i have a teenage daughter she had to go to take your kid to work day so she followed followed me around writing mm-hmm. and so I, I i made her read um guess of the nation by frank o'connor which is my ultimate favorite short story one of my if, if i could write guess of the nation by frank o'connor and never write anything again i'd die happy mm-hmm. and she got to the end and she was just like it's so dark the ending is not a happy ending mm-hmm. right and the ending it's basically a whole master class in post-traumatic stress disorder yep. right and the last and, line is things were never the same after that yeah things, things were never were the same after that right yeah, yeah. and he's witnessed a, he's witnessed an execution and he's realized this, this whole war is not a game that he's in and she's like, but there's so, so much dark. funny in that there's so much funny in that story. yeah and there's a lot of funny in that too right i mean there's the whole the, they're playing cards there's the old woman who is clearly off a rocker and she's like it's so dark and i was like sometimes things are dark that's just we can and sometimes it's nice to go and watch something fun and pretend it's not dark for a bit but yep. i don't know for some reason my mind always just comes back to the bad things and trying to make sense or rationalize them or just try to get through them however you can. Uh, I think this is a really great question. And I think, um, I, don't, I don't think you can have darkness and, 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 and sad experiences without having humor. It's some part of it. I think it's a coping. I think it's part of just as human beings is something that we learn as a survival skill for coping, you know, just coping with what life throws at us. Um, I think about some of the darkest times in my life and these moments, you know, moments that suddenly you and your family or whoever you're grieving with suddenly bond you, you, you so you're on your way to the to the cemetery and somebody makes an observation and suddenly everyone is just it just cracks the you know shat, shat, so finally for a moment that that pain is kind of shattered and you all share in this kind of dark hilarity and I just uh, I, I think it's something that it, you it just comes it just naturally comes out of struggle and it naturally comes out of turmoil um, and I think if for making art it's uh, something that kind of when you tap into that when you are creating a story that de- that is dark and it does deal with really hard issues that part that spark of humor is what is very recognizable I think to to the reader and you know just as our experience as he, fellow human beings it's, it's part of empathy i think that's true yeah, the empathy the empathy kind of leaps it's, it's the, the empathy kind of leads to darkness into a kind of negative tissue yeah. okay, okay Elaine? yeah um i'm still invisible but that's fine <laughs> um i use a lot i didn't uh like Megan, I never thought of myself as a funny person. Uh, and then one of my stories uh, was read somewhere and people were like, oh, wow, you know, that's that's really darkly humorous. It's funny. I go, OK, um, I didn't know I, I wasn't doing it intentionally to be funny. But I think um, my humor is uh, a form of healing. It's a form of neutralizing pain uh, because it's a painful world. And um, I think that's a very uh, maritime Atlantic trait to use a humor to um, neutralize wounds that could disable you otherwise, you know, emotionally, mentally disable you. So I think if you can find some dark humor um, in what's happening around you, it, 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 lightens the, uh, it lightens the load a little bit. Um, so that's what I do. And I write a lot, I write about people who are uh, marginal. So I always try to have some compassion for my marginal people and uh, and and empathy. And I think the uh, finding some light moments helps me do that. Yeah. I did a one story though that I gave a purposefully the one I just read a purposely yes. happy ending. <laughs> so. Yes. Um. Uh, the other thing about these books, I think they kind of all share in common, is there is incredible um, formal variety uh, in in all of them. Um, as you move, start, there are some languages and there are some kind of consistencies that run through the books. But uh, 
a reader is going to see one writer making a, a whole variety of a whole variety of assumptions in the game. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? You're a little wobbly. Okay, just one second. It says I, I came here to uh, came here to use the university's Wi-Fi because I thought it'd be good. Is it is it good now? It's better now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what I was saying was the books have a lot of formal variety in them. That that though there's one writer at work, the reader is going to see that one writer uh, making a whole bunch of different uh, formal decisions in how they construct their narratives. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, short story form for a bit and how you would match certain formal decisions to your content or, or how does it work? How do you make your, your construction decisions? Or what is the use of variety? Like, like these are not all, these are not one note story, no, one note story collections. They, they, they show a lot of uh, different ways of doing it. Yeah, I, I change voice in the story until I find a voice that works. And that includes whether it's first person, third person, rarely second person. Um, I do that as for the format, the form. Um, I just kind of wing it, basically. But I have to have the I have to have the voice. I have to know what's driving the character. I have to know what's important to the character, what the character's issue is before I decide first person, third person, then before I come up with the format for the story. Megan? Again, and maybe this is just because my background isn't hasn't been coming up through English or MFA. Um, I often have, I get one sentence or one scene or one idea, and it's just the story builds from that. And I don't necessarily always have a very clear idea of why this story came out of that one sentence, it came as being in first person, or this story out of one image of something um, ended up being only a page versus 20 pages. It's just something Possibly I just don't have the vocabulary from that back because I, I'm coming from a dissimilar background as to why certain stories I write it as certain things. Again, sometimes it probably ties back a bit to what I was saying earlier about, you know, writing a novel versus a short story. I, after spending a long time trying to force stuff, now it's just, if it feels right, I just go with it rather than trying necessarily to force it and or to try to understand it, or to even make a conscious decision. I find a lot of the times, anytime I try to make a conscious decision in my writing, all my characters and my setting, and even the words rebel against me, they, they just don't work anymore. So almost just try to let the writing go where it goes. And if it ends up being structurally different from one story to the next, then it's structurally different from one story to the next. And so you're just like the difference between your one page story and your six five page story is just like, like it just yeah it's just the one page story that was it that that was what I wanted story. to say your one page story could have been sixty five pages long I think yeah I know but it was like this is what I want to say it was it was a reminder of an incident that I'd had when I was working in East Africa and I was like this is this is all I need this is what I want to say about this piece. And to me, it felt good enough. So I was like, yep, moving on to, yeah, now I'll write this 65 page story that's set in some weird quasi dystopia. And because that was what felt right for that story. Bridget? I'm so happy I'm going last. <laughs> What do I do? Um, uh, I think this question is really interesting because it connects also to the first question about short stories. And I often think about them exploring a moment, but what's nice about writing short stories is being able to kind of 
try on characters. So I think I kind of tend to focus on moments and the moments can come from memories. They can come from something I've seen in the news. Oftentimes there are things that scare me and I try to explore that fear. And then often, um, then the other part of that is being able to, nice thing with short stories is kind of moving from different points of view. So sometimes I'll think about one event and think about how one person might experience and then the, someone else, like who else is in the room? Um, as oftentimes when I'm writing, I'd like to think that there are, there's, I try to have, it's a, to limit the amount of kind of one dimensional characters. Like if there's someone else who's experiencing that, like what is, how, how are they coming to that? So uh, that helped with me with some of the stories in this book because I have some interconnected ones where there are different characters who don't know each other, but they have experienced similar things. They have been around a specific event and have their own experience of that. So I think it's kind of, um, for me, it's like, it's almost like I kind of picture like a web where there are different people who are connected and yet isolated. And what I guess I'm trying to do is see how everybody's <laughs> operating at the same time. Um, so yeah, I, I, basically the, 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 it, it's an, it's nice to kind of jump almost into different minds or if from different, how a different character might approach something or experience that, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question and everybody else, we should be, um, I have a couple questions in the Q&A that we'll get to, but so if you want to ask a question, type it into the chat while we're going around on this last one. Uh, and this last one's about the theme of uh, communication, or uh, in, in some cases, it's about technology, like I think that first story that Bridget read is, is about a, an email sent in in one, like just showing up and there's a I think you did read it, right? We're like, oh no, he's going to see that I read it. He's going to see that I read it. Uh, and that's going to cause uh, tension. There's a lot of kind of contemporary communication uh, themes in, in all the books as well, uh, um, like tweeting or, or, or I love that letter that's delivered by hand to Detroit. Uh, um, so can you talk a little bit about the theme of communication or connection between characters, something about, I, I think it's a, just an interesting thing that's been happening in short fiction, like either how to represent emails or how to represent tweets or, or just how you think of communication uh, functioning thematically and also like how you represent it in, in your stories. How does communication uh, between characters sort of work? It's not just dialogue. You're all, you also have great dialogue. All these books have great dialogue. So if you just want to talk about dialogue, that's fine with me too. But I'm interested in the, uh, in the theme of, of communication in, uh, in all these stories. Do you want to go first, Elaine? Oh, we'll go Bridget. Okay. Do you want to go Bridget? Yeah. Uh, sure. It's um, something I've done in my first novel and with the short story collection as well is a lot of, um, you know, virtual uh, dialogue. And it's such an interesting way to, when you're writing direct dialogue, and direct dialogues can do so many things like establish character, establish plot, keep the plot moving. But sometimes in direct dialogues, it's important to also write the subtext, like the things that are being unsaid. And the interesting thing I find with doing, um, you know, instant messaging is stuff like that is, you know, you're giving someone a chance to decide how they are going to present themselves. Exactly. And exactly. there's all these layers of also just um, I, I, uh, layers of relationships. Like, you know, we're able to walk around right now as a device where we can have private conversations in your pocket at a, any time. So there's so many, and in some ways it's kind of, it makes for some kind of complicated decisions. And I think sometimes if you watch even like TV shows and movies that are maybe about 15 years old and the way they're showing, uh, you know, things on computers and in text messages, they're kind of clunky, but I think we're getting into a point now where we are able to kind of represent it very quickly and show a whole other kind of layers of meaning and um, so much about characters and how they decide to either banter or ignore each other uh, when it comes to, to, to this type of dialogue. So um, I think it's really fascinating. It is. It is. Um, yeah. Um, I did one story um, in this collection that um, I thought pointed out the absurdity of, of some type of uh, social media and some type of communication. And it had a story and it started with a tweet. And it, it was a real tweet. It was actually a, from the Globe and Mail. And it said, 
Are you on your third marriage? What's That's it like? What I was thinking of for you, yeah. <laughs> Pros, cons, email a reporter. And, and I, to me, it was just so absurd. Like, well, what do you think it's like? Um, so the whole story consisted of people on it, earnestly replying back to Deidre and telling them what it was like to be on their third marriage. And I had a lot of fun with it because each character um, who emailed had their own voice, very distinct setting, very distinct story. Uh, so I think I had like six or seven people replying to her and telling her what it was like to be on their third marriage. So that was me exploiting social media and I think in a way making fun of it at the same time. Yeah. Megan? I think I'm really bad at including things like cell phones and texting in my stories because nobody believes this. I don't own a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have a cell phone. Um, and so like, it's not something in my day-to-day -day life. So. But communication is huge. Communication like I, is huge. Yeah, I know. And I, if I, at my job, I, I work contract work. So there's going to be six weeks of summer where I'm not paid. And so I told people I'm turning my work email off and they're like, well, how are we going to talk to you? You don't have a phone. You're not checking your work email. I say, I live in a small town, like you, everyone literally knows where I live. They will see me walking out and about, but yeah, they're just terrified of, you know, and these are not people that I talk to on a daily basis. These are just not being able to communicate so readily with anybody at any time. The minute the thought hits them is just terrifying. It seems to be terrifying to a lot of the people at my job and maybe that's because I work in mathematics and computer science so they're used to having all the tech stuff but yeah so in my books yeah in the stories I don't even know if there's anybody who writes anything on a cell phone or goes on a computer not in your really I don't... it's in some sort of weird quasi parallel world where everybody is mod. there's a few stories that aren't modern yes but you know some of the ones that seem to take place in the now they don't seem to have that technology. It's uh, it's very like even that even that bit in the back seat of the car, or like the one I really love is the mm -hmm. Detroit the the driving to Detroit to deliver yeah. a handwritten letter. Here, this mm -hmm. is you. Yeah. Um. So um. Yeah. All beautiful stuff, and I'll just say to uh, all the readers that. Uh, all these books will uh, will reward your attention and you'll find so many little hidden uh, gems in all of them. So we're going to run through some of these great those great questions in the chat. I'm going to do them in order. Um, so Angela is writing to us from Tennessee. Uh, yeah, so you better have a, <laughs> an, an answer worthy of Tennessee. <laughs> worthy of Tennessee and they are wondering if you start envisioning a new story with your plot first your character verse first an intriguing issue uh we've seen this talking about the voice or how it goes so we'll try to be we'll try to move through these as quickly as we can so uh just just shout it out uh I know maybe you start in different ways but what's I, I'd say what's the most effective way for starting uh for each of you um I usually start with character uh, but in this collection, I decided to start in maybe four stories with setting because I had in setting settings that I really wanted to explore and uh, payday loan company, uh, political road. <laughs> so I found those settings so intriguing. So I, I started with the setting and then made the characters work. But usually I start with character. Okay. Megan, Bridget. I, I almost always start with some sort of dialogue, even in stories that don't have dialogue. So I guess that's a character thing. There's usually voice, there's that's... usually two people that are talking or three people that are talking or somebody is saying something. And then even if that doesn't end up in the final story, it's usually this, I guess that goes back to communication. It's this idea of having to communicate something to someone. Bridget? Uh, and I would say I probably start with the issue or the idea and it almost becomes like I, I, I consider that and then I think what kind of possibilities it almost sometimes feels like a domino effect so it's usually issue then character and then plot because I think about the choices a character would make in regards to that issue. And here's an interesting question uh, Dinah or Dina 
uh, repeating something from Anik Dupont, who always has good ideas, asking about architecture. So do you consider the architecture, uh, when you consider the architecture of your stories, which three threads are the tightest threads that hold together the architecture or structure of your stories? This is, you know, a question that I think other people don't realize that stories get built, right? So um, what's the what's the tightest thread holding your stories together? Is it the issue? Is that sort of the same thing? Or what would you say? What holds your stories together? Something that I probably shouldn't say. So, uh, sometimes, <laughs> here we go. Um, uh, sometimes I will add the thread later. I know that's a terrible thing to admit. Uh, once I have the ending, um, I will. I, I, the story will be written and it'll be sound and it'll work. But sometimes I have endings that I didn't know I was going to write when I started. So when the ending happens, I then may have to go back and and strengthen the thread throughout so the ending... across the middle yeah this is a load bearing wall now yeah you got it i retrofit right uh so i retrofit the story so that the ending makes uh, holds better so sometimes i will do that i think i do something similar with that as well like sometimes as i'm writing something a thread appears like it's something like, oh, I, there's a whole other aspect of this that I haven't considered. And that kind of becomes, and it might come to the surface more than what I was planning in the first place. So, so I guess, um, yeah, I, I guess it, it, it makes me, it makes me feel like I'm building some kind of Jenga tower. <laughs> I don't really know what's holding it up, but, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes, oftentimes when I first come and I think what the structure of a story is by the time I'm somewhere in the process, often sometimes it, it changes and it kind of, uh, it, can, it can often surprise me. Yeah, you sure know when it's not working. That's what, yeah, when, when the whole thing is falling down on your head, you're like, oh, no, there's no uh, structure in this story. Megan? I think I don't approach stories as much building as uncovering. So I always I always feel like when my when I'm talking about stories, it's more like digging rather than building something up. So I kind of just dig around and then maybe I'll something catch it out of the corner of my eye and I'm like, I'll go dig over there. But and maybe maybe digging is just sort of like the inverse of building, <laughs> like you're going you're baking a hole rather than constructing something. So maybe it's really the same thing. But yeah, for me, it's hard to sort of think of being of a story being built because it's just not, I think, how my brain approaches the problem. Okay. It's more of an uncovery. 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 I know it's not a word, but I like it. It's an uncovery. Diane is asking us about haunting stories. There's an example of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. And Megan, you are already off the, you're, you don't even have to do this one because you've already... You've already given us uh, Frank O'Connor's Guests of the Nation, but you could offer a second one if you like. So uh, panel, what stories haunt you after many years? Stories that you like that you're still thinking of? The lottery is just too terrifying for words. Um, but um, Flannery O'Connor, a good man is hard to find. Um, the uh, the bad guy who, and that's an example of- The misfit. Yeah. The misfit, yeah, geniusly weaving the thread throughout. You, the misfit pops up in about four times in the story, and then in the end, it's it's all about him. So that story haunts me. It haunts lots of people, yeah. Bridget? There are a number of Alice Monroe stories that mm -hmm. um, really stand out to me. And of course, I've completely blanked on their titles right now. Um, there's one about... The the guy who shows up and he's cut the phone lines and he's he, anyway uh he, he it's she's able i mean alice morales of course is an absolute master and and can do something like you know uh, the, the, contain 50 years of someone's life in a paragraph and you know exactly where they are at this moment of time. Um, there's a story by uh, Michael Winter that I think about all the time and it's called The Jawbone Box, I believe. And it's about him and his brother moose hunting. And uh, it's, it's about moose poaching. <laughs> this whole dynamic with the brother. It is just, it's so, it's so like a, a it, 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 I remember it just took me by surprise so much. So I think about that one all the time. 
but uh, this could be a conversation that could easily go on for over, you know, uh, a long time. There's a lot of short stories I really love, especially ones by Lisa Moore and Michael Cromie and people like that. So, yeah. Well, that slides easily into our, because uh, I know that Michael uh, Winter, anyway, uh, this, this story is, do you create your characters based on real people or do they come alive in the writing process with their own uh, with their own characteristics, quirks, characteristic traits, etc.? I know, I was talking to Michael Winter once about this, that his brother said, if you ever, if you ever <laughs> write one more story about me, I will deliver to your arse a boot, right? Because his brother was like, his brother was like, yeah, Michael Winter's brother. <laughs> So, so uh, what do you think? Do you create your characters based on real people or do they come alive in the writing process? My people are hybrids. Uh, my people are hybrids. They're, they're, I take traits and quotes and frailties and strengths from everybody I know. And fortunately, nobody in my family reads my books. So that's a good thing. <laughs> so yeah, on minor. There's all traces of real people in my characters. Yeah. I think it's a, a sometimes they, 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 they do come, of course, you're inspired by real life and, and, and real people and real situations. But in some ways, I just, they're all you in a way. Like even if you've taken a piece of dialogue or description mm -hmm. of stuff, it still comes from you. So I, yeah, I, I agree with that that term hybrid that Elaine just used. They are, um, it comes from the well, and you are the well, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I kind of feel Bridget stole my answer because <laughs> you went first. Yeah, she went first. She managed to unmute before I did. Oh, uh -huh. sorry. <laughs> I kind of feel like every everything. I ever write is just me is just some facet of me um I think like a lot of us we a lot of us maybe writers have some sort of trauma that we're trying to there's a level of writing as a way of processing trauma and I know and for I know me there's some instances there and it's just my own voice sometimes just trying to work through something that maybe I haven't been able to work through before but it's still me it's still like Megan is this person in this story, even if nobody else sees it. Okay, we're gonna, I guess we'll do two more. Um, how do you know when the story is finished? Uh, or do you just keep revising and revising and revising? Um, this question does come up a lot, but I, it kind of connects back to your structure bits and to your, like uh, your your uncovery bits, like uh, you're like, oh, I am uncovering as I go. But uh, so, how do you know when you're finished? Um, I'll start if that's okay. Uh, for me, there's usually a point where I've worked on it so hard that I can't see it anymore. It's like I'm too close to it. Um, I and everyone. I often compare it to painting because everyone in my family paints except for me. And this often the same question, like, when do you stop? Like it's adding a bit of color or adding this or, you know, um, re you know, adding a more shadow or something like that. So I, I think, and I've, I've seen my, my, my mother and my sister and brother do this. Like they basically, you have to put it down for a while and wait to see it with fresh eyes. That might be the point that I actually show it to someone else. So usually for me, I have to let it rest and wait uh, some time, maybe get some feedback on it and then come back to it. Usually at that point when I can kind of see it again, that's when I can feel like, okay, this is almost done or this needs more work. Um, so it's usually, you know, it does take, I'm not able to turn stuff. I, I, I'll write a lot, but I, I'm always putting things down and picking them up. Yeah, I totally agree with you putting it down and coming back to it. And I'm one of these bizarre multitaskers. So I have all these balls in the air. And sometimes I will put one aside, save it and come back a couple of days later. And does that work? And on a good day, it works. On a bad day, oh, geez, what the hell did you do there? Right. So it's <laughs> but, it, but putting it aside for a, for a little bit of time does help you uh, decide if it has the impact you want. I mean, I also put my work aside and bring it back. Um, I find it's, 
I find there's often a point if I'm reading and I'm still and it's not smooth like I'm getting I'm reading and I'm like I want to fix this then it's not done but there mm. are other and I mean there's always going to be time there's even now and anything I've ever published I want to go back and fix things but I mean it goes from I want to fix every single word to you know maybe I only want to fix every other sentence to maybe I only want to fix one thing on this page and we're getting to like I can get through a whole page without just being like no I have to fiddle with this I have to put a comma here I have to go to thesaurus.com because this is the wrong word like when I can get through like a page or two of that like consistently then usually I'm like okay it's there's not much left to do here and then I I, I pretend I'm I pretend I'm done at that point well I'm gonna pay tribute again this just seems like this is not a compliment that I give out too easily, but those books all read exactly like that. Those books read exactly like someone has spent a lot of time on on uh, spent a lot of time on them. Uh, and um, the the level of polish at the level of the sentence and the level of the paragraph is just uh, you know like we all know this. You have to make a good sentence and then you make a good paragraph and then you make a good story out of those uh, out of those basic components. But the sentence level writing is just off the charts. OK, do your short story characters ever surprise you and change where you thought your story was going to go? Or does this brief format make this impossible? I will tell you it does not make this impossible, uh, does not make this impossible. Uh, but so do your characters ever surprise y'all? I do surprising things. I'm not sure that they surprise me because okay. I'm make, I'm making them do the bad things. Um, mm -hmm. So, but do they change? Yeah, their motivation changes during the writing. Uh, their qualities change. I was somewhere once, and they asked me why I wrote a lot of male characters in my short stories, and I said that I only <laughs> it's awful. Um, I mainly write male characters when I want to do something bad to the character because I don't like to do bad things to women because I feel like that's a bull. <laughs> that's seen, yes, that's seen. If you're gonna hit someone with a bus, if you're gonna hit someone with a bus, yeah. It's gonna be a man. I'm never yeah, gonna I run noticed that. I noticed bus. that, yeah. So anyway, all right, <laughs> that's it. Anybody else on, did your characters ever surprise you? Um, mine do. I'll sometimes think that I know how, how the ending is going to go. And then I realize, oh, no, they actually wouldn't make this decision or they actually wouldn't feel this way. And it does. It does. So you all the time. Yeah. I always feel like my, my characters just do what they want. I almost there's so many times I feel I have no control over them whatsoever. And there are stories where I've started, and I'm like, this character is definitely going to be in this place three pages later. And then they don't go, they don't go anywhere near there. And I can't get them there because they clearly want to be somewhere else. And so they're always surprising me. And oh, I know yeah. that I'm supposed to be in charge of them, but I am clearly not. They're just this doing their own thing. <laughs> yeah, this dovetails great with our last question, which is about plot. Uh, our last question is about plot saying, how do you do you spend time plotting out the plot? Sorry, do you spend time planning out the plots of your story, or uh, like do you have it kind of sequenced? What's that process like? I don't plot my story, so you don't plot. Yeah, no. they just go. They they go where they go, or you already know where they're going. It's probably a terrible mistake, but I, I don't. <laughs> I don't plot. They they go where they're going to go. So um, perhaps someone who's studied more than I have, maybe they do plot their stories, maybe they uh, are uh, have a better process, but mine just, they just go. Um, I will get to a point where I do plot it. It's actually, I, Megan, I love what you said before, but un what was it, uncovery? Because I often think about like first drafts. I don't think about plot or outlines too much at that point because I I think I think about first drafts like 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 if you're building a house I, I'm just digging the hole to put the house in so I'm not going to think about what the wallpaper is going to look like or you know curtains because I'm just digging the hole <laughs> to actually get the foundation in so usually at some point when I have the first draft done or close to the draft first drafting done I'll kind of stop 
and I will do things like do an outline. Um, sometimes I'll get like a really big piece of paper and actually draw out the setting and think about where things are happening and try to put things in order. And oftentimes I'll come back to the draft and move stuff around. So it's a, it's a bit of back and forth like that for me. I do that with novels. I will go back and, and after I've written it, go back and write down each scene to see if it makes any sense and to see if there's a proper order. Um, but yeah, I don't do it with my short stories, but I will do it with novels. Megan? Again, I, I'm, I'm really bad at plotting. I think I've only ever plotted something. I, the novel that I published, Enid Strange, I did do plotting when I got about 10 pages from the end. <laughs> and I plotted out the last 10 pages. <laughs> and that was about all I could, all I could handle. And I'm friends with Eric Sparling, who is a Nova Scotia author who lives near me. And he thinks this is insane. He plots everything out he, ahead of time. His whole books, he knows, you know, there's going to be 200 words on this. There's going to be four chapters on that. And I'm just like, nope. <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether plotting is just not my strength because I'm more drawn to characters and dialogue. And I'll, I feel that plot will just sort of um, organically develop from that or whether... Maybe I should work harder on it, but I, I almost, I did plot the last 10 pages of the one novel I published. That's the only time I think I've actively plotted something out. Okay, so we've reached about 8.05, 8.07. I want to thank uh, all of you. Uh, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Megan, Bridget, and Elaine, both for their uh, excellent, insightful, like sometimes these dis discussions can kind of seem uh, you know, surface level, but the, thanks for your very detailed, rich uh, conversation. And thank you for your books, especially. Uh, sometimes we all know like prize culture is the way it is, but in this case, I'm, you know, again, speaking for our family, we're so glad that uh, dad's name could be used to make a prize that brings uh, your work to so many readers. And I hope all the readers Hope all the readers here um, will go out and find these books. Uh, I again want to thank the jury. I don't care who wins. I don't care who wins. Uh, I, I feel like I I, uh, I got the prize myself just by reading all this great stuff. Rebecca, are you going to do the Are you going to do the official digital sign off to send us off into uh, the, the, the blank void? I think we're good to have you say our farewells for us, Alexander. Okay, so it's a big, uh, it's a big farewell. Again, be safe, everybody in Atlantic Canada. I hope you're well wherever you are. Tune in. Are these these events are live streamed? I know they are, right, Heather? So you can, I think, tune in to watch who's going to win this award on Wednesday, uh, and um, other other awards on Monday. So uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to the readers. And um, yes, AtlanticBookAwards.ca for the live stream. Okay, everyone. Uh, it. <laughs> so thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it. No, all good. It's an honor. Congratulations to all of you. And we'll see you all uh, down the road. Take care.